Mercedes Harness, and this is Cheryl L. And together we wrote the grant for the Big Read, which is a community-wide read of a good book. And the selected title this year is The Cold Millions. And over January and February, we have been offering um, activities and community programs that bring people together to discuss the themes of the book. And one of the themes in the book is about um, an indigenous history and how we tell our stories and which stories we choose to lift up. One of my favorite characters in the book is Jules, who's, who is Salish. And he works really hard uh, for the cause of the labor unions. And yet there are very few people who are on the, the uh, side of Jules who are working to protect his rights. So I really wanted to take a moment to include uh, programming around um, our around how we choose to tell our stories today and how we lift up um, the indigenous parts of our history. And that led me to, led us to Passages Alaska, which is a new indigenized arts infused Alaska studies curriculum that invites students to explore Alaska histories, cultures, and contemporary identities and create artistic expressions of family and community stories that acknowledge and celebrate their own lived experiences as integral parts of Alaska's unfolding history. I also, before we go much farther, would like to give um, a land acknowledgement. Um, we are situated within the sovereign boundaries of Nanilchik Village Tribe, lands that have been stewarded for thousands of years since time immemorial by the indigenous people of the region, the Denina, Sukbiak, Yubiak, and Kachmak peoples before them, and we are grateful. Um, um, good afternoon. Today we're here to share with you about Passages Alaska, a very unique Alaska Studies curriculum. Um, and as Mercedes said earlier, it's an arts integrated Alaska Studies course, and it invites students to share their own stories and create family and community connections through artistic expression. One of the most important things is that they're celebrating their own lived experiences. It is a ninth grade social studies curriculum that um, is also part of the state of Alaska graduation requirements. So it fulfills that Alaska studies requirement um, for all students in the state of Alaska. Thank you, Jen. Um, I'm Asia Freeman, and I'm excited to introduce the curriculum development team. And that team is made up of Jen, who was just speaking. She was, when we began this adventure, the education director at Alaska Native Heritage Center. And Jen, like Gary and Nita, is Yupik from Southern Alaska, and also Gwich'in, which is a tribal group from a much more northern section of Alaska. Also with us is Nita uh, Yuruk Reardon, an Alaska Native Yupik from the village of Kotlik. Nita is on the board of the Alaska Arts Education Consortium, and she was involved with the Alaska State Council on the Arts Alignment of New Arts Standards with Alaska Cultural Standards. She won the 2019 Alaska Governor's Arts and Humanities Award for her longstanding dedication and impact as an educator in Bethel, where among other things, she, wrote, she translated traditional Yupik culture activities into art projects. I am Asia Freeman, an arts artist and arts educator who works as artistic director of Benell Street Art Center in Homer, a multidisciplinary art space. And with that program, I am the administrator of the Kenai Peninsula Artists and Schools program. I also teach at the University of Alaska and serve on the boards of the Alaska Arts and Culture Foundation. And also with us is Ryan Conero. And um, Ryan is one of the creators of Alakshka, Alaska, the um, play which inspired Passages Alaska curriculum. Ryan and Justin Perkins from New York and Gary Beaver from Kasigaluk are all part of that team. And we're really grateful that this fabulous group, Jen, Nita, and Ryan can join me and all of you today for this opportunity to learn about Passages Alaska. 
Thanks so much, Asia. Yes, I'm Ryan Conero. Uh, nice to meet you all. I'm so glad to get to be here. Um, I think what so what we're going to do today is share a little bit about contextualize what Asia just sort of uh, uh, summarized the creation of this interdisciplinary production, and then that led to the creation of the Passage of Alaska Arts Education Curriculum. Um, and we're going to start with some introductions and some engagement with each other in some of the kind of um, some of the, you know, begin to get right into some of the core values that are at the heart of this curriculum passages of Alaska. Uh, we want to talk about uh, names. Um, let's do this. Um, Nita, I know you want to speak about contextualizing uh, names and naming um, through uh, your cultural lens. So maybe we could start there if you'd like to. Oh, yeah, no, Ryan. Yes. Um... Naming in a Yupi culture is the names we carry. We there's a awesome value called atpakta. The process of being able to mention that their Yupi name, for instance, Marluirut Makwani Huinga at Atishwanga Yochlimk. My late grandmother named me Yochlik. And my name is carried on a name after my uncle on my mother's side, the youngest of her sons. And as I was growing up, the name that I carried, even if it was a male name, there's no gender in Yupik, we carry our Yupik names knowing and getting to know who we were named after. I learned my uncle was a, a very good hunter and he took care of his family very awesomely and raised his own children. So when he passed away, the three of his kids that became orphans were, were taken by my grandmother. And those three, when they took me into their homes, treated me just like their father. I was able to go in a kayak and go kayak riding with my, my first cousin. I was able to go hunting with him, uh, such as muskrats in the springtime and fishing during the winter time. So our names are very important who were named after and we carried them to do the exact the same things that they did for us as we were named. Many names today, every time when a new child is born, we know other people who are deceased in the family system as a family together, so that name is carried on. Many of our names are just ancient as well as newer names of the Yupik names that we have. Oyana. And that's it. Mm. Thank you, Nita. Uh, so that actually uh, names, if you will, uh, several of the sort of core values, themes, um, cultural threads that are running through this, this curriculum passages, Alaska. Names, naming, place, family lineage, culture, um, and cross-cultural encounter. Uh, so Nita, in a way, I think you you kicked us off so beautifully to, to each share, and we'd love to take a moment to to introduce ourselves, all of us, in, in this Zoom room or in the real room in Homer, and um, uh, just share the name you'd like to go by today. Mine is Ryan. And, uh, and then share uh, one or two sentences, if you can keep it concise, please about um, what you know about this name or another name that you've gone by in the past, if you want to share larger pieces of your name or a large, or your middle name or your last name. Um, so how does your name connect to place in the present or historically, perhaps? Um, how does it connect to uh, relationship as, as Nita, you were describing? Um, and, and then we can kind of get a sense of who's in the room together. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go first so that I can make sense of what I just said. I'm going to share my name uh, and a brief uh, story of uh, some aspect of my name and its meaning or its connection, if I know of any. 
Uh, my name is Ryan Michael Conero. Uh, I am joining from Denver, Colorado, um, the traditional lands of the Ute, Arapaho, and Cheyenne people. Uh, my first name, Ryan, um, comes from the Irish or Gaelic. Uh, it means little king, which I loved when I first learned that when I was a kid. And my mother's uh, side of the family is of Irish descent. So that's where that name comes from. Um, maybe I'll pass it back to you, Nita, if there's anything else you'd like to share by way of your introduction. And then we can go to Jen and then um, to the rest of the group. Thank you. I will introduce myself in my culture, in the language, and I'll tell you afterwards, I'll translate it. Marluigut Mahwani, Nanik Buxo Ratho Kutli Binguluni, At Dairutka Anna Rutkatlu, Yui South Hawk, Igvaklu, Damaram Kutli Bingulunk, We Atra Yokliu. And to make it sort, um, my late grandmother was Nanikoksorak Teresa Kamarov, whom I was raised by until I was six years old. My late parents were Frederick Yuisa and Pauline Ivak Prince, both of Catholic Alaska, where we were raised all together. I am Nita Reardon, Nita Jochlik Reardon, the third child of Frederick and Pauline. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Renee Romer, and um, inevitably people end up calling me Jen once they get to know me. So I'll go by either Jen or Jennifer. Um, I will say that with my English name when I was growing up, I didn't like it because there were so many Jennifers. When I was in fifth grade, there were, no, fourth grade, there were five Jennifers in one classroom. And so we inevitably went by nicknames. Um, but I do want to share my Yupik name, which is Dunatuk. And as um, Nita said, Yupik names are unisex, so uh, they don't have a tie to gender. Um, but also, oftentimes people ask me what that name means. The other one thing that I wanted to share about Yupik culture and our names is that um, some of our names are what we call play names. So they're like a nickname kind of, or a play name, and they don't have a meaning. So it's just, uh, and so my name happens to be a play name. Um, and it was given by an elder um, to my mom uh, when I was born. And um, unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to spend um, as much time in my older age with the family that I was named um, from, but, uh, but my uh, namesake, his wife told me that there's a lot of personality traits that I have, which is often what um, tends to happen in our culture and the importance of naming. So thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name is Asia Braulia Spencer Freeman. And um, it, it carries this so many stories of my family and its extensive travels. Um, my middle name, um, Braulia, is my Mexican name. And I'm coming to you from Mexico, from Chichimeca lands in central Mexico. Um, I was born here in Mexico. And so Braulia appeared on my birth certificate. And my parents um, had a name in mind for me. And so Braulia became a second name. And my first name is Asia. And um, that carries um, the connection of my father's family's immigration from China. And um, so I always have enjoyed um, name stories because I've always felt like mine is such an intrinsic part of my identity as this kind of strange um, global mashup. So uh, as I mentioned, um, I'm joining from Denver, Colorado, which is where I live now. Um, my background is um, I'm originally from North Georgia. My parents are both from the Atlanta area. My father was a, a doctor in the US Army. So I grew up as a military brat. Um, I went to school, to undergraduate school for theater and English. And then it was a community radio station, KNOM radio in Nome that first brought me to Alaska right after college. Um, I lived in Nome and then Juneau, 
and uh, was in living full time in Alaska from 2001 to 2014. Among other things during that time, I spent a fair amount of time uh, working and uh, spending time in communities around the Lower Kuskokwim School District as a teaching artist for LKSD's arts integration programs and also working with the um, Department of Education um, in uh, Yupiat School District. Uh, during that time, I met Gary Beaver, whose name you heard briefly and whose name is going to come up again shortly. Um, in 2014, I was fortunate to uh, get a grant for a residency with Ping Chong and Company. Um, so I moved from Juneau to New York. Uh, Ping Chong and Company is an interdisciplinary arts organization that creates works of theater and art that reveal beauty, invention, precision, and a commitment to social justice. Uh, it was founded by the founding artist director Ping Chong. Uh, the company is a home and a site of experimentation for generations of artists at this point, creates original interdisciplinary community specific work and cultivates artistry, artistry through training and education programs. So I was interested in all of that. Uh, some of it ran parallel to some of the work that I was doing already with some of the folks who are here in the real room, in the Zoom room. Uh, I see past collaborators and thank you for coming. Um, specifically, I was really interested in, in um, how Ping and his associate director, Sarah Zatz, crafted a process where they invited community stories and then community storytellers were a part of the performance of those stories that we continue to include everyone as opposed to other models of community theater, community story theater, where actors step in and pretend to be the quote unquote real people. Um, so meeting Ping and the rest of the company, um, we began to talk about maybe we can do a project back in Alaska. And that's what led to Alakshka, Alaska. Ping and I began talking about it. We invited Gary Upayak Beaver to join us and also Justin Perkins, who is a New York based performer and puppet designer. Uh, these are images from the show that you see. Um, the piece is uh, using multimedia projection, puppetry and central Yupik drum and dance to explore um, cross-cultural encounter in Alaska, centered on stories that Gary and I told as Gary as an insider to Alaska and me as an outsider. And it also weaves uh, historical stories, lesser known historical stories of cross-cultural encounter of moments of collision between people and cultures in Alaska history. Um, so this, this piece, I should say, it tells stories and histories from across this, what is the state of Alaska, the political boundary, the state, uh, from across cultural backgrounds. But the, the Alakshka, Alaska is sort of centered in the central Yupik region of Southwest Alaska, um, given the fact that so many of the personal stories in the piece are Gary's, that he's really um, grounding us in that region. Um, so we, I just want to acknowledge that the the piece is grounded in these personal stories between Gary and me, where we are really centering first person storytelling, that we're sort of trying to live the value in Alaska, Alaska, that one, uh, that one has the right and agency to tell one's own story and to push against a sort of anthropological lens that has been so often brought into Alaska and to other indigenous communities around the world to say we're going to um, uh, outsiders are going to come in and, and place a magnifying glass figuratively or sometimes literally on what's happening here and then tell the story of it without participation or agency of that community. Um, so that's a sort of core value of this as well. Um, so we uh, premiered the piece in uh, at University of Alaska Anchorage in 2017 and then we're happy to tour it uh, in several regions of the state in the fall of 2017. And then it ran at off Broadway at La Mama um, in New York. And then in 2018, we did a second Alaska tour of the production as well. Uh, during that time, we activated a series of community engagement circles, community dialogues around the content of the show, um, responding to the show. So um, I'd love to kick it over to you, uh, Jen and Nita, to reflect on some of that process. Jen, this is how you, of course, joined the project, is, is when we were beginning this process and you were at the Alaska Native Heritage Center. Um, so maybe I could ask you to speak to that a little bit. 
Sure. I was working at the Alaska Native Heritage Center as the education director. And part of my um, role was to also in the summertime work with our young interns that were from high school age to um, their young 20s. Um, and we were able to involve them in this process. And what I found very unique about um, one, Alaska, Alaska, uh, and the cross-cultural factor, but two, really taking ownership of telling our own stories. And so we were able to bring together young people from the Heritage Center um, to attend the play. And then also afterwards, we, were, we made them available to interview any of the audience members that wanted to share their story or any aspect of Alaska um, and maybe it could be um, how their family got to Alaska, how many generations they've been here, whether they were homesteaders or Alaska Native people, um, any aspect of um, their own lived experiences that they wanted. And it gave an opportunity for young people to practice their interviewing skills. And we were able to record some of these um, for integration to the website, as well as potential integration to um, the play at a later time. Um, after that, um, we invited audience members to come together um, in a separate room. Um, and we had sort of a sharing and discussion that I was able to facilitate. And it was so powerful because people were able to reflect on what they, um, maybe some of the feelings or um, things that they learned as they watched the play, um, as well as uh, it ended up integrating um, aspects of current events and issues that happen in Alaska based on some of the historical things that were seen in the play and the unique um, aspect of really looking at what does it mean to share our lived experiences through cross-cultural connections, as well as, um, you know, emotions were brought up because it's not always, cross-cultural connections are not always positive. We hope that they're positive the majority of the time, but I think that in order to live together in a community, we also have to be able to talk about um, some of the things that arise, uh, maybe negative emotions. So it was extremely powerful and I would say empowering. Um, and it was one of the most unique experiences that I had uh, watching a play because people were able to actually debrief and share their lived experiences. So um, that's what sort of connected me to this project. And uh, I couldn't be happier because I had such an amazing experience doing that facilitation, um, which also led to the, the, the curriculum writing. So um, thank you. And I'll hand it over to Nita to add some. Koyana, um, at the time when this was sown at uh, Bethel Regional High School with a community involved, I was working for uh, Laura Kuskakum School District as a language and cultural specialist for the district. Anyway, we attended, and I do remember when KYUK came around and was interviewing after the so the gatherings of the people what did they think or how did they feel um what what do you think these things it really opened the community an idea uh, of something that they've never experienced before in their life it was like a eye opener to them it was something like oh my goodness, we've had trauma all our lives. We've never been part of it. We've had all these other experiences throughout our history. We weren't involved. Interestingly, previous to this, uh, so that Ryan is involved, he also was involved um, what we called Alaska statehood with LKSD students from all over um, the villages the questions to our teachers and the kids was, how would you have celebrated Alaska if you were involved when it became a state in 1959? 
interestingly, many of the interviews that uh, people had done, our um, elders had told historical events and stories. Nope, they were not asked if they could become a state. They were not involved of how we, as part of Alaskans, were involved. Indigenous peoples were never involved. But this one was like the kids, the students and teachers came out with ideas and they celebrated either like a play or a theater play, uh, a dance or um, some kind of creative art that they shared if they were involved. It opened our eyes. Students can be involved. And so did um, Passages of Alaska, this one, this play, that allowed our people, can we talk about it? Can we say something? Can we be involved with it? Oh my goodness, we are part of Alaskan history. How do we get our indigenous people to say so and have an ownership being part of Alaskan history? Those kind of stories came around and then how we could get our own uh, village, especially the village people involved in it. Um, it's still a big uh, talk about, and it's still, there are still issues still um, as we speak um, that are not necessarily corrected yet, but I think we're on the road to it, towards it. Oyan, back to you, Ryan. Thank you, Nita. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And um, it's important to to acknowledge and lift up how um, how important a role, how central a role the community of Homer and Benel Street Art Center specifically played in the development of the theater production of Alaska, Alaska and in the two tours, making them possible. And that was um, thanks so much to you, Asia. So I'd love to just ask you to share, you know, why, why, why uh, support it so deeply and with so many resources. Thank you, Ryan. Um, you know, growing up in Homer, I knew very little about its history and um, the fact that Homer is a community that is built on native lands. It's built on the lands of Nichilna, and um, we're surrounded by um, indigenous people and stories. And one thing at Benel that has been really important to us, well, first of all, our mission is to strengthen the physical, social, and economic fiber of Alaska through the arts. And we have learned through artists that there are incredible opportunities to do that strengthening work, especially socially and culturally, by um, investing in projects that tell more true and nuanced stories of people and place. And as part of that um, intention, we co-commissioned the Alaska, Alaska production, and we're very fortunate to have the play here for a creation residency and be a part of its tours in Alaska, helping it to go across the bay to Nanwalek, to go to the Performing Arts Center in Anchorage, and so forth. And in this process, we have been able to do some deep work of resisting um, some of the impacts of ongoing colonialism. And that is really what um, Passages Alaska curriculum does, is it helps us to see opportunities that, that we all have to participate, as Nita said, in the writing of Alaska's story today. And it's unfolding. It's an unfolding story. Uh, behind the tour of Alaska, Alaska. Here we go. This is a video uh, production by Katie Basil and Bethel. Alaska, Alaska is a piece about cross cultural encounter in Alaska. Stories of people meeting across boundaries of difference. Uh, one is from an outsider's point of view, the other is from an insider's point of view, who's a native Alaskan, and the third is the historical point of view of things that have happened in Alaska. My name is Gary Beaver, and I'm from Gasigl, Alaska. I'm a subsistence hunter and a family man. My name is Ryan Conero. For this project, I'm co-creator and co-director and a performer in the piece. 
My name is Justin Perkins. I'm a puppet performer and a designer and builder of puppets and other objects for theater. My name is Ping Chong and I am from New York City and I'm a theater director. We're a theater company that wants to build bridges and break down barriers and stereotypes so that people can recognize each other's humanity. I interviewed Ryan and it turns out he had lived in Alaska for 12 years and I said, well, let's do a show about Alaska. You can remember flying to Alaska. Ryan was looking at what it meant to be an outsider coming here. They pass you again. This time... Right on your shirt. Your arm. Your face. Gary comes to this being a total uh, indigenous person to this place and what his experience is in relation to the outsider is. The first white people you ever see were on that screen. And the first Gussock you know is a man named Bill. This theater style was one of my dreams to perform in front of people on a stage level. If a state trooper showed up here on this ground store, would he want to know you? Your family? Would he want to know your name? You're just a native. Does your life matter? Are you even a human being? I just wanted out in what we do, what we go through as Yupik people in our region, Kasugok area, what we're going through. I want it out to be known. tour with Alaksha Alaska. We premiered the show at University of Alaska Anchorage. Now we're preparing to present the show in Bethel and then we go on to Kasigaluk, then to Nome and Homer. And after Homer we move the show to an off-Broadway run at La Mama in New York. The opportunity to bring it to Kasigaluk really makes this uh, reciprocal sharing of work and of storytelling, and it holds us accountable in a way that I think is vital. It's easy to go to another place and say, I'm gonna tell stories about this far off land that you audience members might exoticize or just not know much about, and so accept everything as truth. But now coming back to Western Alaska, we have opportunity and time to be with community members, audience members afterwards and say, what did you think? Moose pasta, <laughs> salmon, a uh, red salmon, akutak, and um, stota. I'm having my first bowl of abuda. What do you think? Co it's really great. Yeah, Corrected. please, come on in. Aguta. <laughs> Aguta. <laughs> Alexa, Alaska, from Ping Chang Company, perform a Sihok, 7.30, Ta Yulia Ta Nashtok, Agili Hangaitok, Kuya Nap Nartitas, Pit of Jehok, Kuya Nap. Thank you. 
Michigan, a un otro look de tejo. The seal surfaces again. And the man shoots. Nutka. It really brings back um, a lot of our history, Alaskan history. Overall felt on the midst between comfortable and uncomfortable, which is exactly where you need to be in order to have a real thought for making money. I'm astonished, really, really surprised that the soul is above the ceiling. I hope this play will help them to understand. Along with being a theater production, Alakshka Alaska is also a project of community engagement. We organized 20 or so community engagement events around productions of the show. Um, those included things like educational puppetry workshops and story circles and discussions, you know, post-show discussions with special guests. We had community dialogues. And those are opportunities for people to continue to engage with the themes of the show after having seen the performance. Some people wrote uh, some of the most beautiful moments visually. And Justin, would you just share, you know, three or four of those for us? Fox Hunt, uh, the ocean scenes on the screen, closing song and dance. I feel like sometimes I don't want to be the white guy trying too hard in the village. I don't want to be the one that starts conversations. I feel like I don't know how to start a conversation with some of the native men in the village and women. And so that was really... I have an awakening for me that it's not just me feeling that way sometimes, that I'd be, you know, got to get over it and just try. So we are all human beings. We hurt, we feel. That's how I felt. Everyone please say, Alakshka! 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 One really special cross-cultural event like this was the Akmani workshop at La Mama in conjunction with La Mama Kids. We were able to connect with artists at the Alaska Native Heritage Center in Anchorage via a live video link and held a workshop where New York kids learned from these artists um, indigenous dance forms and drum and storytelling techniques. And back up, so there's these big waves on each side of the boat. And then the boat rolls around the rough water again. One, two, three. And then while we're out there boating, we caught some food, and now we got to hang up the food. The meat's dry. The, the sort of one, beautiful two, sprawl three. of Alakshka, Alaska, this, this production, this, this community engagement project, led to the creation of Encounters Alaska, which is a web archive of the recorded stories of Alaskans from across the state telling their stories of cross-cultural encounter. In the theater performance, you hear a few of these voices excerpted in small little bits, but on the website, you can go and meet the people visually, read more of their in interviews, and hear more of their voices. 100 years from now. 50 years from now. I really don't know where Alaska's going. 50 gone. years from now. 50 years from now. I think the sad part would be that our culture would be gone. Our language is already dying. And with our kids today, you know, they want to be like any other kid who, with a technology that makes it easier for them, you know, be with the times of what goes on right now today. That's the sad part, is knowing that one day this is not all going to be here, our culture. The kids are going to be so grounded in who they are and where they came from because 50 years from now, the kids will have 
everything at their, all the history documented because their grandparents are videoing how to make a hard saw makla, how to make a fire with friction, how to gather blue ice for drinking water when you're out. I don't know if there'll be ice then though. <laughs> I think uh, 50 years from now, I think we'll be like, we'll, we'll be living in the life of Wall Street. If you look at the average person in New York, they won't be any different out here. You know, people with the internet and everything else, you have access to all the news instantly. This generation of kids is amazing. You know, some of them have moved on to where they're ready for the future. I mean, think that they, they won't slow down for anything. Thank you. Thank you. If you have uh, questions about this piece of the journey, the, the production itself, uh, maybe jot those or hold on to them because we'll have a little time. We're hoping to make a little time at the end to, um, to discuss things. Um, let me jump back into the slideshow if it's going to let me do that. I want to take a moment to, to just uh, acknowledge, thank, uh, and lift up Gary um, and you know his central role in making this show possible saying saying yes to this idea uh the bravery and vulnerability of sharing his stories both you know uh across the country and at home um, and his participation and collaboration on the creation of this curriculum as well um so thank you to gary uh we're gonna zoom in now on this curriculum uh, as we toured um we uh, we're presenting often at schools or with educators present at the theaters where we were hosted. And we started to hear again and again, this would really be um, a great Alaska studies curriculum. And so happily, uh, this team of folks said, let's like pursue that question. Um, so I'll kick it over to you, uh, Jen, to kind of take us into the curriculum, if you would, please. Sure, thank you. Um, well, when we started this process out, we had our initial retreat together in Bethel, and that was sort of an organizational and planning retreat where we were able to look at, one, some of the um, historical um, experiences and stories that took place in the play, and how could we set this up to um, utilize arts integration, we had to reflect on where Alaska studies um, as a course is in the state of Alaska, how it looked in uh, Lower Kuskokwim School District. Um, so we had an initial meeting, uh, initial planning meeting in Bethel, Alaska. And then um, as we moved forward with our outline and initial planning, um, then the, pan the pandemic hit. And so uh, um, much of our planning sessions or excuse me, I would say work sessions um, for the bulk of the curriculum were virtual, um, which was also helpful for us because we were all in different towns or cities. Um, and so we were able to come together with um, a great deal of virtual sessions um, that were also very, uh, very lengthy, um, but um, good work um, to pull the to pull the draft of the curriculum together. And then in the fall of 2022, um, like most school districts, when you adopt new curriculum, you have to have a pilot. And so we were able to pilot the program. Or excuse me, pilot the curriculum in three different classroom settings. And one of them was a virtual classroom um, out of Bethel with a teacher out of Bethel. And then the other two classrooms were in the villages of Tuntatuliak and Nabaskiak. And so um, they were able to take and pilot for nine weeks uh, the curriculum that we had. So here is um, some photos of classroom time with students. And that was one of the most important things was, as we all know, curriculum can, when we're writing a lesson plan or an overall curriculum, our ideas as educators could be like, wow, this is gonna be amazing in the classroom. Um, you know, the kids are really gonna be engaged. And then sometimes it flops. And we know as educators, we have to pivot 
And that's why this feedback was really important on the pilot. Um, at the end of the nine weeks, we were able to come back together um, as a curriculum team and head out back out to Bethel and visit with uh, the teachers that piloted the program. We were able to solicit their feedback of what went well, what needed improvement, and more so, how could we make adjustments so that we had the best curriculum possible. Um, we were also able to show and have screenings of Alaksha Alaska um, and Q&A sessions because um, the play is such an integral part of this curriculum that um, it was really important to hear the questions that educators as well as community members had. In August 2022, uh, myself and Ryan and Christina, the director of education for Ping Chong Company, and as well as another staff member, Che Song, were able to come together in New York City. And we were able to put together any of the feedback and adaptations that educators and community members and students gave us um, to finalize the curriculum and sort of hash out when we had a three-day work session. Um, but I would say one of the most important things about looking at this curriculum, especially um, when we look at the fact that this is a social studies course, but it's arts integration. And myself, as someone who taught social studies in, in Alaska um, for many, many years, and particularly this course, um, I got a little gun shy about the art aspect of it because I don't necessarily see myself as an artist. And we knew going into this that many, many educators might feel the same way that I did. And so what we wanted to do was really emphasize that within this curriculum, um, teachers are facilitators, but they're also students at the same time. And so, um, as we're going through the curriculum, the students are participating, but the teachers are participating with them. And so they will create their own pieces. They will learn about um, some of the aspects that are uh, of historical um, experiences that are happening in Alexa, Alaska. Oftentimes, uh, uh, like Ryan said earlier, these um, might be little known um, historical scenarios. Uh, and so we really wanted to emphasize that teachers are learning along with their students. And so Ryan and I were able to create a five minute introduction video that emphasizes this um, and sort of walks through how educators should tackle the curriculum and how they will be growing along with their students. And I will hand it over to Nita to talk a little bit about the adoption process in Lower Kuskokwim School District, as well as the teacher training. So as Jennifer said that um, uh, the teachers were all involved and yes, they were afraid of to do the uh, art, the, especially if you're not an um, art teacher, but they all expressed they learned about the arts through the curriculum at the same time along with their students. We had a wonderful visit at Napaskiak and um, in Bethel and went through the whole curriculum and found what had glitzes and what didn't and what was most favorable and how the teachers had really good input most of the curriculum was uh, wanted to be retained and some were changes. And so it was good that the curriculum was adopted by LKSD after piloting a year. And so it's being taught third year, third year this year. Yes, third year this year um, and It'll be interesting to hear from them how they're doing or if there were new teachers who are teaching it or if there are more uh, villagers who are teaching it. That part I haven't heard yet. 
So it'll be interesting to hear that part. Poyana. Hi, I just, um, it's Asia, and I just wanted to add in where we are now. Um, currently, the um, University of Alaska Anchorage is seeking funding to archive and house this curriculum so that it's available to um, schools across Alaska and can take it farther by regionalizing their curriculum so that it's um, regionally relevant. Um, but it is actually even now available through Ping Chang and company. And so folks who are interested are welcome to contact us at Benel Street Arts Center. Um, and I can connect you with um, Ping Chang as far as find, getting access to this curriculum. Thank you, Asia. So, and, and thanks to each of you. So that's a real uh, meaty where, when, where, how, who, when of, uh, how Passages Alaska the Course came to be. I want to underline uh, that and acknowledge LKSD as the initial uh, entity that said, yes, let's actually pursue this and make space for it for us to our first retreat as this team was there. Um, and also acknowledge Alaska State Council on the Arts and the New England Foundation for the Arts, NIFA, for funding support that made it possible for us to gather, meet, and, and uh, do these work sessions. Um, followed again by LKSD's support to pilot and review the curriculum as we went through those steps. So uh, let's get into the what of the curriculum. What is Passages Alaska? I'd love to send it back over to you, Jen. Yes, and so we said earlier it's an arts integrated Alaska studies course and students are able to um, create artistic expression through multiple modalities. And as you go through each um, unit of the curriculum, you'll see that, um, that there are different opportunities for students to uh, express themselves based on the project in each unit. And I'll talk a little bit more in depth on that um, later on. But um, like I said earlier, it's a ninth grade curriculum and it fulfills the Alaska Studies requirement for graduation. Um, it's really important to note uh, what Ryan said that LKSD was really the um, the one that uh, moved forward and said like, let's actually do this. Um, and so the the initial design of the course is a nine week is nine um, units that are each one week long and they have five 90 minute lessons for each one. Um, now, LKSD, their um, scheduling looks a little bit different because um, nine weeks is gonna be one quarter um, and they complete an entire course in one quarter. That's not how every district looks. So as we look at the potential for um, utilizing this in other districts, it's really important to, to note that um, although we put a timeline that matches LKSD schedule, it's adaptable to any other district. So you can take the materials and sort of spread it out throughout a longer semester period based on the school district that you work in. Each lesson has um, the normal things that you would see in a curriculum. There's a summary of what uh, the lesson's going to be about. There's a teacher introduction to, to give um, feedback for teachers on the best way to set up their classrooms um, in order to create our in order to uh, input the less impart the lesson. Um, there's a list of materials as well as all of the links that you would need to participate in the lesson. Um, but I would say most importantly, there are um, background knowledge for um, UPIC um, culture. And also there are recorded pronunciations for the Yupik words that are in each lesson. Um, so that's gonna help teachers feel more comfortable um, because oftentimes we know that many of the educators that are in Alaska aren't necessarily from Alaska or they're not necessarily indigenous or Alaska native um, or Yupik particularly. And what we wanna do is really promote the fact that um, this is a community involved um, curriculum. And what that means is we want uh, educators 
to feel very comfortable to invite elders within the classroom, as well as other culture bearers um, to help participate and enrich each of the lessons and give background knowledge. Um, it's really awesome to have Nita working with us because she was able to help give us a lot of the traditional stories and background that's needed within each lesson so that we can feel um, that we're giving a whole um, experience to students. And part of that, Nita and I were able to work, we've known each other for a very long time, since I was like 20 years old. And both of us worked on the Alaska um, Standards for Culturally Responsive Schools. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in detail, but that's um, each of the, um, are each of the lessons have the Alaska stand Alaska culturally responsive standards in them, and part of that is about integrating elders, integrating culture, um, allowing uh, educators to understand that you're part of the community, um, and not an outsider. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about the standards later on. And then I, I urge you to write down any questions because I know you're not looking exactly at the curriculum, but I'd like to break down the units that we looked at. Um, and what we were uh, what we were challenged with was really taking the historical um, stories that were in Alaska, Alaska, and how do we look at the Alaska history um, requirements and standards and integrate it. Um, so I'll talk a little bit briefly about the units. Um, unit one, we look at who am I and who are you? And so it goes back to um, our initial engagement, naming of places and people and how important that is to our identity, um, identity as self, but also identity as a community. And, that, and it really brings in that co cross-cultural aspect because our self-identity is extremely important, but as we look at um, at the importance of engaging with one another and this ongoing, um, that it's important to look at history as well as understand that we're still uh, moving forward together. Um, the naming of places and people is very important. So uh, it's that intersection um, in order to create community with one another. Um, unit two looks at cross-cultural encounters in Alaska. Um, so we look at the indigenous tribes. Um, and then of course, one of the requirements is uh, to look at colonization and vitus bearing coming to Alaska. Um, and then in a larger context, we're able to um, define culture for students and define what cross-cultural means. Um, I think oftentimes uh, students use words and maybe they're not taken deeper to have a deeper meaning and understanding of it. And this really is the core of the entire um, curriculum, which is looking at culture and cross-cultural. Unit three looks at Seward's folly, statehood and satire. Um, and this is a fun one because uh, Sometimes it, it becomes, very, we had uh, many, many discussions about how to explain satire to students because I think that um, it has to do with, um, it's not just giving a definition. And sometimes we don't want students to misunderstand what we're doing. It's kind of like if you think about being an educator and maybe you have a sarcastic personality and you can't necessarily be sarcastic all the time because students, some students don't understand sarcasm and they'll take it literally. Um, and so it's really, we had deep, deep discussions about what does satire mean and how do we convey that to students so that they can really get the most out of this unit. Uh, unit four, we looked at boarding schools, um, the Organic Act and Molly Hooch. Now this is gonna be, um, especially in LKSD, I would say that uh, looking at Molly Hooch, um, I would say a lot of our teachers and students really understand um, this court case. Um, but I wouldn't say that that's the case uh, necessarily across the state of Alaska or um, in other districts as much. And so we really delved into the importance of looking at this um, and like Nita said earlier, uh, 
the lived experiences of people who went to boarding school is on a very large spectrum. And it's really important to look at that because right now, um, in as we're looking at issues in the United States and Canada, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of negative um, experiences in boarding schools, which is really important to look at as well. But like I said, it's a spectrum and um, Nita, as well as um, other of our colleagues that went to school with her had very positive experiences at their schools. So it's really important for us to break this down. And I get excited about the um, potential of other districts utilizing this curriculum because I think it's a exposure that um, doesn't necessarily happen. So this one we look in unit five, we look at World War II in Alaska and oftentimes um, people don't think about the um, experiences uh, during World War II and, and the fact that our state was a lot more involved in this than um, people recognize. Uh, I think what's important to point out as we go through these units is that if you look at the Alaska standards for Alaska history, um, every section um, that, that um, we want students to know and be able to understand has an element of indigenous um, history. Um, and so that's the importance of this uh, particular curriculum because it's through an ind indigenous perspective. Um, and, and so we look at World War II through that perspective. In unit six, we look at project Chariot, Howard Rock, and ANXA. And this is a lot of information. And I think ANXA is one of the um, most intimidating for educators. Many of them also do not um, have a historical understanding of Howard Rock, who he was, and the creation of the Tundra Times, um, as well as uh, Project Chariot and the impact that it had in that region. And so we are able to uh, break that down and do an art project with that. In unit seven, we look at resources in Alaska. And I think this is, uh, looks at how do we look at the past, like with things like Exxon Valdez oil spill, as well as how are these going to impact the future and issues that we need to tackle together as a community and as a state. And so one of the things that we integrated was um, climate activism and looking at it from the perspective of um, an indigenous perspective, as well as a greater um, non-indigenous uh, global perspective. Um, unit eight became a very interesting conversation because we looked at ep epidemics in Alaska and the impact that they've had on our history. And we were also going through the pandemic at this time. So it, it um, garnered very interesting conversation as we were developing the, the lessons in this unit. And then unit nine is a, a, a Luxia, Alaska. And we look at sort of bringing everything together and consider the journey and the history of Alaska, as well as the vision for our future um, through the lens of um, our own lived experiences and our, um, our strength in community, I would say. And I'm gonna pass it over to Asia and she's gonna talk more about arts integration. Thank you, Jen. So obviously the curriculum really focuses on these key historical moments and, and the stories um, and um, impacts to how we tell Alaska's story. And what um, this curriculum does that's very special is engage um, and integrate the arts. What does that mean and why are we doing it? So Passages Alaska is arts infused, which means that each unit is pairing social studies content and the Alaska history content standards with a creative project that's linked to directly or inspired by the content of Alaska, Alaska. Arts integration is an approach to learning in which students can construct and demonstrate understanding through art forms. 
and students will engage in a creative process which connects an art form in another subject area and meets evolving objectives with both. Here you can see you know, a Venn diagram where we're using art standards to teach art skills and at the same time to develop understanding and mastery with another content area. So perhaps, for example, with satire, you know, in telling um, the story of the purchase of Alaska, a student has an opportunity to create their own um, interpretive cartoon. And in, in so doing, they are thinking about how, you know, that story might resonate for them personally. And the physical act of doing it also can um, help them to, you know, meditatively and kind of um, thoughtfully take the time to really absorb the, the depth of um, content that is here in this incredibly rich and dense um, historical you know, time frame that, that Jennifer has just spoken about. Here are um, uh, ways that we can think about the value of integrating the arts. It, it, the opportunity to make and engage in a creative process gives students buy-in. It gives them an opportunity to really participate at a deeper level in absorbing um, the lesson. It engages their critical thinking skills. You know, they're thinking and constructing meaning through the learning activity. It may very importantly um, create a more equitable environment for learning because in this moment of um, creative interpretation, all stories are valued and also a variety of different ways of telling them, meaning the classroom isn't just elevating, you know, one kind of story or experience. And um, the students, wherever they may be from, as Alaskan kids today are from all kinds of places, have a chance to place their story in um, the Alaskan context. And through this, they engage in connective learning. And there's um, really research evidence-based pathways that teach skills um, and um, natural avenues, as we say, for differentiating information. It's, it's connective learning. Finally, we think of um, arts integration as an empowerment practice, because in the process of instructors being facilitators of creative learning, and also learners right alongside their students, they are empowered in ways that many teachers may not be. Um, it's interesting to think about the fact that Often the teachers of Alaska studies are the newest people to Alaska. They're, they're young teachers and maybe they're novices to the story of Alaska. So they have a chance right alongside their students to, um, you know, develop their own professional growth, you know, and um, skill set in teaching and, and students are doing it with them and, and, and that's just a, a really kind of novel and very valuable um, opportunity. I'll jump in and um, just share a glimpse of what those arts projects are, those arts engagements are that are woven through this curriculum. As it says at the top of the slide, it's an interdisciplinary art uh, engagement. In other words, uh, educators and young people are invited to explore multiple disciplines of art. Um, I think it's really exciting. The, the, this A mirrors the production of Luxco Alaska, um, which uses, as we said, multimedia projections, sound, music and dance, uh, puppetry, you know, scenic design. So we've got all kinds of elements of art. Um, so that's one reason for that. Another is that uh, we invite multiple modalities. And um, coming back to your point about equity, Asia, you know, there's there's going to be a point in this journey of the course where any of us would be out of our comfort zone. Uh, I have a performance background and there's some visual art projects in this curriculum that are not um, as comfortable for me to dive into. Um, so it's intentionally designed that way to, to invite everyone to, to shine and to then explore their boundaries. Um, so unit one. Uh, we introduce a critical response process, a really simple um, praise, ponder, polish, uh, so that students can cultivate feedback and cultivate their own sense of um, technical craft and also taste as artists. Uh, and then there's a storytelling uh, project, a theatrical storytelling project. Unit two uh, includes a shadow puppetry project. Unit three 
uh, includes, as we've mentioned, satire and political cartoons inspired by those that emerged during the era when Seward was talking about buying Alaska. Uh, Unit four includes uh, a writing project, writing from the perspectives of characters uh, during the history that we're talking about, writing monologues and then sharing those. Unit five, we invite students to engage in interviews and then interpret those interviews as, as poetry, as poems. Uh, unit six is a sculpture project. Uh, we think about leadership in these really key, enormous moments in Alaska history's ANCSA, Project Chariot. We look at Howard Rock as a, just one example of many of uh, important leaders in Alaska, and then the students um, engage in a project envisioning themselves as future leaders through sculpture. Uh, unit seven, um, uh, Jen, you mentioned that there, there's focus in the unit around um, climate activism. And so this, the arts project is to design a social media campaign um, inspired by the activis activists that we study in the unit. Um, unit eight, epidemic in Alaska, uh, there's another uh, designing another public, public health campaign and looking at sort of media literacy and engaging with uh, imagery in the media. And then in the final unit, students can self-select an art form from the journey that they've been on to craft a final project. Um, other elements that are included artistically in the um, curriculum are uh, video clips from the show in every unit. And those are timed. They're, we guide the teacher. Uh, unit two, first day of the unit, let's watch a video clip from the show. But another unit might delay that and share it midweek or at the end of the week as sort of a conclusion or culmination. Um, those provide often models for the artistic project that's gonna be made. One example would be uh, unit two uh, shares the scene, the opening scene or the second scene, I should say, of Alexka, Alaska when we see, um, I think we have a slide for this, let me see. We see Justin, the puppeteer, uh, performing, using shadow puppets, the arrival of Vitus Bering being met um, by indigenous Unungan people in their boats. And so um, that inspires and provides a model for um, the creation of shadow puppets by the young people by the, who are taking the course. Um, each unit also includes links to EncountersAlaska.com, the website we mentioned, so students can share other Alaskan stories that are not necessarily in the show. And then the, the last unit of the show is when students uh, get to finally see the full production of Alaska Alaska. They've seen bits of it. They've seen eight, I guess, eight weeks. They've seen uh, clips of the show. And then unit nine is sort of put it all together and um, reflect back. Jen, you want to talk about standards? Sure. And I know there's a lot of um, wording on these slides. Um, and I think that sort of speaks to the extensive process that we had with um, aligning standards to each lesson. Um, one of the unique things that um, when that uh, is part of this curriculum when we look at standards is, one, we started with the Alaska history content standards, which are the most important as far as the material that each student is supposed to know for their graduation. Um, but I think that if we look deeper into it, we were able to integrate in every single lesson four sets of standards. Um, like I said, the Alaska history content standards, but we also integrated standards from the Alaska arts anchor standards um, and we utilized grades 10 and 11. Those standards look a little bit different um, than others. Um, like I said earlier, we integrated standards from the Alaska standards for culturally responsive schools. Um, and if you look at those standards, um, we're looking at self, community, school, um, and the larger aspects of how do we bring in um, cultural bearers as well as elders and other community members to help students become um, as culturally knowledgeable as they can. And then the and then final to that, we also integrated social emotional learning standards. 
in each of the lessons. And this becomes important for educators because I think um, oftentimes educators tend to view SEL as a separate subject matter or a separate thing that we do. And in all reality, these um, standards integrated very well because it's about building relationships with your students and students building relationships with one another. And so with the social emotional learning standards, it becomes important because it's like, how do I introspectively look at myself, which is important for the artwork? And then how do I communicate well with others and be respectful? And so we found that it was very important to integrate SEL and, um, and uh, put out there that SEL is something we do in every interaction that we have. So if you look at a couple of these examples, um, for example, in Arts Anchor Standard Number 10, it's to synthesize and relate knowledge to personal experiences from all art forms. And then the substandards that we looked at with cultural standards was for students to be culturally knowledgeable and to build on that knowledge through local community, as well as for students to actively participate in multiple cultural environments. And so, as you can see, it was a very extensive process where we took each of these standards and aligned them to each lesson, um, as well as the history content standards. And so uh, due to time, if you guys have questions, we can talk a little bit more about that, but I know there's a lot of verbiage on there. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And like I said, uh, it's, a key component of the standards is the Alaska Standards for Culturally Responsive Schools. Uh, the movement in education initially started with culturally responsive. How do, and I would say the core of that is building relationships. How do we um, create um, settings within our school systems that um, nurture building relationships and uh, look at and value the cultures of each of the people in our classrooms. Um, that has grown into what we call culturally sustaining education. And I would say when you look at the term sustaining, it's more about the future, like um, how do we grow during the setting that we're in in the classroom, but allow students to look to the future. Um, so when we look at culturally sustaining education, we're talking about valuing the languages and the cultural practices, the ways of being. I think that's a really important aspect to look at um, for this particular curriculum, um, as well as how are schools accountable to the community um, and how are schools, I would say, part of the community. Um, the curriculum, also connects to cultural and linguistic histories. And I think that that's really what we tried to um, make sure was happening in each of the lessons, as well as providing access to the dominant culture. So it's sort of that um, walking in two worlds. I know that a lot of our indigenous students feel that, um, but I would say that you could have um, students of other cultures that are feeling the same way. Um, in larger districts, if they utilize this curriculum, it could be students that were refugees or it could be students that uh, their families immigrated. Um, so I think it's really important to look at all of those aspects and think about um, culturally sustaining education as going deeper than culturally responsive education. And so I wanted to um, ask Nita to add um, anything that she would like to this very large topic of culturally responsive and sustaining education. Thank you, Jen. Um, to let the audience know, Alaska art standards have adopted cultural art standards and it's the only standards that have adopted the cultural standards that we have written many years back. And um, we're fortunate to have that. And so, if you talk about cultural standards and you're talking about integrating the art, cultural arts, it would be amazing how in the Sukhbek area, which is Homer uh, from Port Graham and Nanwalik, 
how their arts can be integrated right into this units. And I could see many other things while they're doing, you're learning about um, the Sukhberg history and their arts. And their art is very interesting anyway. So just hearing all of this, I was just um, trying to think of my Alaskan history that I had in, in, um, in high school. My old Alaskan history was something that I had to memorize dates and events. And that was the tests. So in today's world, when you integrate a uh, place-based education using the cultural environment um, and the local knowledge, wouldn't you like to be a teacher? <laughs> you would make a the best teacher around the kids that would love to enjoy learning from one another versus just learning one-sided. You're learning two-sided streets and then having the kids know and involving the elders. Elders have a lot of knowledge that they haven't even shared in the historical times and gaining from them what they would know at their uh, stand, their own standards, they have standards, how survival was for them during all these events and all these units that the, um, the class will be started. So thanks to everybody that um, for this arts, the cultural arts were already embedded into the Alaska state standards, Poyana. So yeah, I'll just uh, say Koyana and thank you for to everyone here, uh, my collaborators, um, uh, the Homer Library folks, and then uh, those of you who joined us to to participate and listen and hopefully share a little bit in the next section. Uh, before we go on, uh, here's info on the slide on uh, how to learn more about Passages Alaska. Um, as you mentioned, Asia, this is available now. Uh, from Ping Chang and Company or for LKSD educators from their district office. Christina Bixland is the education director at Ping Chang and Company and uh, her email address is Christina at pingchang.org or you could reach out to folks at Benel, as you said, Asia. Um, so I think now we'd love to uh, make some time and space. Um, we've got about uh, 20 minutes. Um, uh, Asia, Nita, Jen, are we good to move into Q&A discussion time? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so we'd love to make space and time for um, thoughts, questions. Uh, we've shared about the production that um, that led to the creation of the curriculum. We've shared a little bit about Ping Chang and Company, uh, and we shared out the process and content of the curriculum. Uh, so we'd be happy to dive further into any of that um, if you'd like to talk about it. Hi, hey, my name is Judy Gonzalez and I'm here in Homer. And uh, first of all, thank you for your great presentation. And um, I lived a little over 20 years out in Southwest Alaska in Bristol Bay. And I just, in looking at those nine units and the content within, I just think it's really, really impressive and exciting. And Nita, yes, I think it would be uh, great to be a ninth grade history teacher, you know, to implement this. I have a couple questions, and 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 one is, I was thinking about, uh, I think it was uh, Jen who said the performance was sort of the foundation of this curriculum. Is that would that be correct, Brian? Or not to wordsmith too much, but um, I would say yes. I, I might not call it the foundation of the curriculum. I think it was the inspiration for. And the, it weaves through the experience, okay. but the curriculum the curriculum isn't about the show. The show kind of is the springboard for learning. Okay, because in my mind, I was forming the question of, so if I were the teacher, would I would I show the performance to my students before I implemented the curriculum? And you already answered that. No, you don't. You just show parts of it per unit. And I'm I'm curious if you had when you were when you were developing the curriculum, were you having conversations about whether or not you should show as the teacher the whole performance from the get-go for sort of a holistic approach right from the get-go, 
you, uh, you had those conversations and I'm just curious about how you did, you ended up deciding on uh, bits and pieces and then the end uh, unit, unit nine is, is on that um, production. Yeah, we had a lot of discussion and debate about that question. Do, should we show the, should we screen the entire theater production in week one or at some later point? And obviously what you're um, highlighting is we decided to wait till the end of the, of the journey of the course. Um, I think I'll, I'll share and then see if others want to jump in, but I think there were a lot of considerations here. One is, um, really prioritizing, uh, active engagement with history and with art materials happening quite quickly in the curriculum. Given most schools calendar day, it's not possible to screen the show in one sitting. It would take two periods mm -hmm. um, and not wanting, just on a very, like an engagement level, a student engagement level, we didn't feel great about starting with like two days of watching a screen. <laughs> um, and, and conversely, let's watch a clip that's, I, I don't remember the first clip we see, but I think it's three to five minutes long that hopefully is short enough that students aren't possibly drifting away from interest. And then by the time they see the show at the end, it's a, they're both getting the whole story finally and also having the recognition of like, oh yeah, we saw this scene three weeks ago. Oh, we saw that scene five weeks ago. And then we made a thing just like that we're seeing on the screen. So there's like this kind of familiarity and um, the novelty and discovery happening at once. Mm -hmm. um, Jen, Asia, Anita, I don't know if you want to add anything to that decision. I guess, um, I guess I would add that um, just as the production brings together a lot of different scenes and key moments to tell a story, you know, we also do in our own lives when thinking about key experiences and moments and building, building toward like this bigger view from processing specific scenes and moments more deeply makes, it really kind of empowers the, the, the student and the teacher to really engage in storytelling in a deeper way and to think about how powerful the stories uh, how powerful storytelling is in terms of shaping identities and and surfacing truths and lifting up voices and not to kind of go too quickly toward that and to propose like a vision for what it must be to kids, but rather that, you know, th they have a legitimate process of, you know, building and and telling their own stories. We often in art classes, you know, like um, you don't want to tell them what it needs to look like, right? So we just, we might have a little, a little piece, a provocation, but then really invite their imagination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll actually jump back in and say another, another um, element is, you know, Jen mentioned this, that in the intro video, the five minute video that educator, we ask educators to watch before they teach the course, uh, that Jen and I uh, made with Ping Chong and Company, um, we emphasize, and in every unit it's written, please engage community members and culture bearers in the classroom when you can, where you can. And a couple of times it's even more emphatic and underlined, like you you want to have someone in, involved. And if that throws off the, the calendar a little bit, like that's going to be worth it. Um, <clears throat> There are some moments and stories in Alakshka, Alaska that are vulnerable, that are um, that are really sensitive around some of the real complex difficulties about uh, cross-cultural encounter. Um, and so we felt like both for the students and the educator leading the classroom, it might be better to sort of build um, build capacity in a way to take on those kinds of conversations at the end of the course rather than seeing the whole thing all at once and be like, whoa, there's a lot to mm -hmm. unpack now. What do we, how do we even do this? Mm -hmm. Our hope is that the teacher has had two, three or more guest educators, culture bearers by the end of the course. And some of those could come back in the final week and there's a more collaborative processing possible of the whole show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, well, thank you. I just, I just wanna say, hey, uh, you know, hats off and kudos to you for what looks like a really enriching uh, curriculum. So thanks. Thank you.
Hey there, uh, Todd Hyman. And Hi. Just, hi. <laughs> nice to see you, Todd. Good to see you. Uh, just wondering what the plans are uh, for getting this curriculum disseminated out into various parts of Alaska, and what do you see as the challenges in doing that? And I'll get off camera. You know me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Aza a question. <laughs> Well, it's such a good question, Todd, and really glad that you um, you raised it. Um, the where it stands now is we are um, the Ala University of Alaska Anchorage is interested in in archiving and housing that curriculum to make it available to um, Alaska schools with the ultimate. Um, vision of deeper um, regional engagement that is to, in a sense, regionalize the curriculum, right? You can see that Alaska, Alaska really focuses on Yupik culture, but we're a, a state of many, many cultures. And um, it, that that buy-in and that depth would, would really just be a, a beautiful kind of evolution of um, the opportunity that this curriculum as a structure provides to, to, to lift up any regional culture and the cultures that come in through students as well, through, through, through the exercises and storytelling, naming and so forth. Um, that is a, a really big investment by the university. And so funding is critical for that to kind of take it at that it, to that depth. Um, and so that's where the university at, is at right now is in seeking funding, but it's available. It's already available and it could be adopted by um, districts. And um, that, that opportunity um, is out there. Districts and individual schools can contact Ping Chong, Christina at pingchong.org, um, or contact us at Benel to, to connect you to her and um, get a hold of the curriculum and really um, try it. And, and um, as, you know, LKSD has has tested it and found so much value in it. And so we hope that there'll be initiative on the part of schools across Alaska to get in there and um, take it on. That That's, you know, the adoption of it district by district is, is um, would be a really wonderful step, but it, that's not, um, that's not, uh, hopefully that's not going to limit teachers from reaching out and suggesting it, for example. Yeah, thanks, Asia. I would add, you know, we, based on the experience of touring the production to other regions of the state, including to the Homer and Kachemak Bay region, to communities there, including to the Bering Strait School District in 2018, and to several communities there, and the Nome Public Schools as well. Um, you know, I think we were happy and learned that the the while the stories of the piece are centered in <clears throat> Yupik country, um, there is a lot of resonance and for for people across Alaska and beyond. I hope, um, and also it for any for anyone, it can serve as a springboard for the the sort of uh, you know flipping it around and looking at myself and my lived experience and. Um, taking that forward from there. So I do, I think it would be such a thrill and so exciting if there were resources and support to develop um, versions of the curriculum that had more, had deeper background and context provided regionally across the state. And I do hope and believe it's a useful tool now as it is, uh, wherever folks might want to implement it. I also wanted to add that, you know, in the Homer region where you have people um, who live from all over Alaska um, and a lot of initiative amongst teachers. There's just really incredible opportunities. You know, you have Inupiaq dancers and you have, um, you know, um, Supiaq um, storytellers and um, you have visual artists from all over the state and you could you could engage multiple cultures as as a teacher. That could be an, inc I think that would be a super exciting opportunity, so. It's, um, I think the teacher's imagination is really, you know, the, the, the limiting or expanding factor here. I have two small questions. Can, 
Can a teacher adopt this curriculum by themselves or do they have to get the district to approve the curriculum for them to be able to use it? Like, can someone sort of just one person start? Well, in order for it to be a district-wide approach, the district would have to adopt it. But a teacher could go to their district and ask for permission to teach it. Yeah, I think the key here is that, you know, it's it's LKSD wanted to set out to say we would like to have this be an optional pathway that teachers and students can use to fulfill the requirement of Alaska studies in ninth grade. And so to be able to be a required course, it has to be adopted. Um, it could be used, you know, for quote unquote elective kind of teaching by any teacher anywhere, but to be able to have the student check the box, like I completed my Alaska studies requirement, my understanding is it has to be adopted formally. And then I guess sort of a, another question about that, like, I guess who, who claims and exerts this kind of authority about what curriculums are possible. Do you, you've, you've made this beautiful thing. Um, and then is there, is it just the school district or is there also like a state agency that could prevent something from being adopted or could promote something to be adopted? Like, do you have to, is it really just a district level decision, I guess? You know, um, I would think it would be at the district level to adopt adopting, unless if the state, you know, mandated they they do mandate like REITs Act for the mm -hmm. all districts in the state of Alaska. But uh something like this that's new, I think it's by district now because districts have choices. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I would think it would be them. It's not um it's not adopted by the state yet. And if they did it, they would maybe mandate it, but I don't think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ahead. this is great. And I, I, not to, um, I speak out of turn because I think you need to know better than I do. And I'm sure there are other people in the zoom room or in the room there in Homer that have more experience here, but I think generally speaking, I think, you know, the state, the state department of ed sets learning standards and then districts have the independence to, to adopt a curriculum and say, we're going to achieve that standard using this or that curriculum. Mm -hmm. Actually, if we can get Jen out of the participant role, she had to step out of the Zoom and she can come back in as a presenter. Um, she's uh, really the expert. The question is, um, in order for schools to access this curriculum, can it, can it occur um, classroom by classroom or must it incur, occur district by district? And what authority does the state of Alaska Department of Education have in um, providing or limiting what curriculums are available? such as this one to any classroom. Okay, and that's an interesting discussion that we had a little bit um, prior to getting online with everyone else. And there is no set Alaska studies curriculum for the state of Alaska. And so um, D doesn't dictate, dictate what curriculum is used um, within schools. And that goes for any subject matter. Um, so what they do, um, provide is the standards. So that's the Alaska history content standards that we um, integrate. So those are something that every um, student and classroom must participate through. Um, but the curriculum used to access that um, is, is dictated by each individual district. And then as far as um, answering the portion of the question can an individual teacher integrate this into their classroom? And I would say that that has to do with your school culture. So you would approach your principal and ask the, you, how I would tackle it if I was still in the classroom is I would show my principal the fact that this curriculum meets all of the standards, the Alaska history content standards, and can I utilize this in my classroom? And oftentimes you're gonna get a yes out of that because like I said, there is no set curriculum for Alaska studies, which is what um, it really confuses teachers because uh, like I said earlier, not all teachers have the capacity to curate their own lessons and materials. 
And so this provides a structure for that. And I would say that um, being able to utilize that structure with adaptation um, is extremely important. But yeah, you would approach your principal if you were an individual teacher. And then as far as districts go, they adopt curriculum, but DEED has no say over that adoption. I, I really appreciate that um, clarification, Jen. And and I and because of that, I wanted to add, um, you know, um, the observation that as Alaska Studies is a requirement of both third grade um, elementary education and also high school graduation, typically in the ninth grade, um, couldn't a uh, primary school teacher um, utilize this um, curriculum with the approval of their principal, of course, to um, create a more culturally responsive education for third graders? You know, maybe they wouldn't, you know, go into some units, but um, they might choose um, you know, others that feel more um, relevant, such as um, stories about one's name and um, opportunities to write poetry and interpret um, historical moments. What would you say about that, Jen? Well, I think that adaptation would be um, particularly helpful um, because I think they're struggling at the third grade level as well. Um, I worked on, a, just as a side note, I worked on a, a, a brand new curriculum through Anchorage School District that was for the third grade level of Alaska Studies. And so what they would have to do to make that ad adaptation is use the standards at the third grade level and see how they could match some of the activities that we have. But I think the culturally responsive or sustaining as well as the arts integration would be extremely important for um, teachers to be able to enrich the experience of third graders because the content that they need to take in would be a little bit more um, introductory. So I see third grade standards as the introduction to Alaska history and culture. And then we build on that in ninth grade. But I think that's a really good point that um, in order to make it a more well-rounded, more student-centered, as well as um, provide deeper engagement with community is very important. So I think it would be hoove a lot of third grade teachers to, to look at that aspect of it, Asia. Um, I think it's great and it's exciting. I mean, I like the idea that the teachers are learning along with the students and you're acknowledging that you know, the teachers are not from Alaska and they have to learn this stuff and and some of the issues might be controversial or or uncomfortable or whatever and um, so I think that's really exciting and bringing the arts in and incorporating all those things um and I'm just wondering not for Alaska necessarily as some other states but there's uh, some parental uh, reaction that might be called, this might all be called woke. And, you know, they don't want to spend uh, their kids to, or the, they might complain about the money going into some of this stuff, or I don't know, it might be, um, some people might be uh, react to it, react to that in, the, in that sense. There are some states, they don't want the, um, books to be read or some issues to be addressed or acknowledged and. Thank you for that point. I'd like to add to that. And I think that's the importance of um, and why we worked so hard to integrate standards. And I think teachers have protection um, when they teach lessons by going back to the standards. So especially the Alaska content standards and if you're able to show parents the standards that you're using in each lesson, then you're able to justify why you're teaching that lesson. And I and so you start with the Alaska content standards and then move deeper into the arts, the culturally responsive and the SEL standards. And it looks uh, more well-rounded and then speaking about um, student engagement, student-centered, and project-based learning. Um, and so I think really that's why it's the importance of teachers understanding that 
the state dictates the standards that we're supposed to utilize. And those standards are your backup for why you're teaching something, because it's what students are, the outcomes that students are supposed to have, what they're supposed to know and be able to do. Um, another comment that I just wanted to offer to, to, jo to Joanna's um, observations and enthusiasm is there is no reason why um, this class couldn't also become a course available for teachers as an initial introduction to it through the local, you know, um, branch campus of University of Alaska Anchorage here in Homer, for example. A person could take this curriculum and, you know, take it through um, a semester and just give teachers an opportunity, community members an opportunity. It could be a, a continuing education, a recertification. Those types of credits are of interest to teachers. And just general learning is interesting to our community, right? A great way to um, go deeper into this really rich, um, creative, and um, historical, and unfolding story of Alaska. Very interesting. It could be a multicultural course through the university. <laughs> Ooh, maybe you'd be a part of helping teach it locally. Oh, that would be fun. Good idea. <laughs> but, we'd really like to thank the Homer Public Library again, Cheryl Ilg and Mercedes Harness for inviting this conversation. It's such a, it's, it is so, um, creative to talk with all of you to get your feedback and to think about next steps. And we just want to thank you for giving us your time and expertise today. I've learned so much. And um, one of the joys of doing a community big read is all the different ways you get to know your community, both local and across the broader state as well. So thank you for being a part of that today. All right. Have a good evening. Thanks, folks. Thank you Adriana. all. Bye, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.